just wait on Heather here. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another cup of cosmic coffee here at Lowell Observatory. Uh, this week is International Dark Sky Week, and we've got a very special guest with us, uh, Chris Lugenbuehl of the Flagstaff Dark Skies Coalition. Um, he is a very longtime uh, Flagstaff resident and um, worked for uh, quite some time at the U.S. Naval Observatory as an astronomer there. And so uh, for um, some time since then, he's been uh, heading up the Flagstaff Dark Skies Coalition. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Danielle Adams. I'm filling in for uh, Dr. Jeff Hall, who is uh, uh, not here with us today, but he'll be back next week for um, that uh, episode of Cosmic Coffee. So Chris, uh, welcome uh, to Cosmic Coffee once again. Uh, our regular viewers will remember you from uh, last fall, uh, just ahead of the Flagstaff Star Party, the virtual version. So uh, welcome, uh, uh, why don't you say some words to us? Uh, thank you, Danielle, and welcome to all the people who are viewing. And I wanted to uh, hope that everybody, at least I have, uh, got a cup of coffee here as we talk about cosmic coffee, which I think Lowell Observatory may have thought when they created the program that this was kind of a metaphorical cosmic coffee. But as Carl Sagan would have us know that every, every, uh, every, every atom in me, every carbon atom in me and every carbon atom in these coffee beans is actually real cosmic carbon. It comes from stars. So I'm having my uh, my star stuff coffee this morning and I hope some of your viewers are as well. Yep, indeed. Uh, all of our co coffee around the world is cosmic coffee, <laughs> literally. So um, that's fantastic. Uh, so Chris, uh, tell us a little bit um, about uh, how you got into um, dark sky preservation and dark sky awareness. And, um, and we'll we'll start um, looking into what um, International Dark Sky Week is, and then um, proceed through some um, uh, various issues as we go along. Um, as, as usual, uh, to our viewers, please feel free to pop questions into chat as we go, and uh, we'll just have a, a fun conversation here this morning. Yes. Um, I came to school at NAU in the fall of 1973. Uh, the reason I came, to, I, I, I grew up and went through high school uh, in the East Coast, in Delaware, actually, home of Joe Biden, or later on to be home of Joe Biden. But I wanted to come to the West because uh, not just the na nature and the open spaces, but also for the stars and the night skies. I had become inspired uh, to be, uh, to study astronomy, to spend my career looking at the stars uh, because of, as I recall dimly, uh, an event when I was young when the sky was very dark. I wonder if it might have been from power outages in the late 1960s uh, in an otherwise light polluted area. I was struck by a very star filled sky. Anyway, I came to Flagstaff in the 70s and studied, began studying astronomy at NAU. Uh, after I finished my studies at NAU, I went to graduate school outside of Arizona uh, in Ohio. Uh, when I came back, I became employed at the Naval Observatory in Flagstaff. Initially, my work was a lot of observing, uh, a lot of uh, astronomical research on the sorts of things that the Naval Observatory specializes in, like the measurement of distances of stars or positions of stars. Uh, but as years progressed, it became clear to the Naval Observatory that their continued viable operation was critically dependent upon protecting the dark skies of the observatory. And even though when the observatory was established, the Naval Observatory was established in 1955, five miles west of City Hall, Flagstaff was only about 8,000 people and light pollution wasn't even considered to be a particular concern. But by the 19, by the 19, early 1980s, when I came back to work there, it was becoming clear that Flagstaff's growth was beginning to have an impact. And the observatory recognized that that was something that they could make a difference about. 
uh, astronomers over the years in most observatories continue this pattern of thinking that a light pollution is something that they just have to tolerate. And if it's a problem for their kind of research, then they need to retreat from it. As I say, astronomers have been running from light pollution for, for decades or centuries. Initially, observatories were established all around the world uh, at places where people lived. Uh, there was observatories in Ohio, there's observatories in Toronto, there's observatories in Pennsylvania. But as the light pollution increased in the eastern part of this country, they moved to the west. But then as light pollution increased in the west, they would move to the mountains of California or to southern Arizona. And as light pollution continued to increase now, we've continued to go to ever more remote areas like Chile, mm -hmm. the Atacama Desert. Uh, but the Naval Observatory recognized that wasn't really viable for them. As a government facility, uh, their ability to move to other countries was more limited. But we also really made a realistic assessment of it and thought we could make a difference if we engaged. And I think that was a different kind of a decision for observatories um, uh, compared to what had been done historically to actually decide to try to make a difference in the evolution of light pollution, to try to protect the resource at the site we were at. So that became my job. Uh, I kind of, uh, Took to, like, took to it like a duck to water, an astronomer to a dark sky. And over the years, I increasingly was involved with uh, both studies and research into light pollution, the sources of it, ways you can mitigate it, how effective were various ways of mitigating it, trying to actually put quantities or quantifiable measures to these things to guide our policies and our outreach to try to improve things in the Flagstaff area. And I think we, along with the Lowell Observatory and the Dark Skies Coalition, really have made uh, indisputably a huge difference in the dark skies of Flagstaff by, by taking that hands-on engagement. Yeah. And, you know, um, you mentioned, you know, historically, um, uh, you know, the considerations of, of light pollution and, you um, you know, even in setting up Lowell Observatory 127 years ago now, um, uh, Percival Lowell uh, had read uh, rather recent publications from uh, an astronomer whose name escapes me at this moment um, during his time, where um, uh, the re this new recommendation was to actually set up an observatory away from cities. Um, so you're avoiding both the lights, um, what there was at that time, as well as the physical, um, you know, uh, pollution coming out of the smokestacks. And so, you know, this was one of the first observatories that didn't start out connected to a major city or a major university. It was just, you know, <laughs> in, right. uh, above the hill or on a hill above this tiny little town, Flagstaff right. at that point. Actually, a um, it wasn't even incorporated as a town um, at that point. So yeah. a huge effort made by uh, Percival Lowell to evaluate sites around the West and into Mexico to try to find a place that was suitable for an observatory. That I think I'm not a real uh, astronomical site selection historian, mm -hmm. but I think that must have been one of the first times where observatories were intentionally or the the founder and observatory intentionally put a lot of effort in to try to evaluate the condition of a site for an observatory and to think about the future of that site mm -hmm. rather than just put it out in the backyard of our neighbor of our local community mm -hmm. yeah so so uh after i retired from the naval observatory in 2014 now six and almost seven years ago um even while I was at the observatory, but especially since, I've really focused my efforts on trying to raise awareness amongst the general population that dark skies are of a huge value of all different ways of measuring value to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I say that when people go to the Grand Canyon, they don't look at it and say, boy, that's a really good idea somebody had to, Teddy Roosevelt had to preserve this because by golly, the geologists really need a place to study rocks. Mm -hmm. you never, nobody ever thinks that way about the Grand Canyon. But so many people look at the night sky and they say, gosh, I really like the night skies and it's really important to preserve it so we can do astronomy. 
I'd say thank you very much for that. Uh, as an astronomer, I was always appreciative that people would defer to us that way. Mm -hmm. But to me, for every, uh, just to wave my hands, I don't know real numbers, but for every astronomer out there are probably 10,000 people to whom the stars can be, or just a nice sky can be, bring huge meaning and value to their lives. Um, I wanted to read uh, briefly, if I can stop the sharing yeah. screen, uh, a quote from an author named Henry Beston. Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote a book called The Outermost House that he published in 1928 really when rural electrification still was not fully underway in this country. Uh, lighting had not spread across the landscape the way it has today, but already uh, he was making a point that I'd like to share with the viewers. Uh, he, says, he says the following, learn to reverence night and to put away the vulgar fear of it. For with the banishment of night from the experience of man, there vanishes as well a religious emotion, a poetic mood, which gives depth to the adventure of humanity. By day, space is one with the earth and with man. It is his sun that is shining, his clouds that are floating past. But at night, space is his no more. When the great earth, abandoning day, rolls up the deeps of the heavens and the universe, a new door opens for the human spirit. And there are few so clownish that some awareness of the mystery of being does not touch them as they gaze. For a moment of night, we have a glimpse of ourselves and of our world islanded, islanded in a stream of stars, pilgrims of mortality, voyaging between horizons across eternal seas of space and time. Fugitive though the instant be, the spirit of man is during it ennobled by a genuine moment of emotional dignity and poetry makes its own both the human spirit and experience. Mm, that's beautiful. Henry Beston, I recommend to anybody on the, on the, on the watching this this morning to go find a copy of the book, The Outermost House. It's a wonderful book. It talks about, it's like, it's like uh, Henry David Throw and Walden Pond, but about it includes chapters on the night and stars. It includes other things as well, but it's in that genre and people really, I think could enjoy that. That's great. What is that title again? Henry Beston, The Outermost House. Awesome. So, as so we, uh, yeah, so, as, as we go forward here, go uh, let's just um, take a step um, back and, you know, what is the purpose of International Dark Sky Week? Um, you know, uh, what are we hoping to achieve um, more in this particular week than elsewhere uh, throughout the year? Well, International Dark Sky Week was established uh, by the International Dark Sky Association with very much the purposes we've been touching on here in mind, and that is to raise awareness about, well, I, I, I'll, I'll rearrange, well, the, the way they state it is to raise awareness about light pollution, to raise awareness about the solutions to light pollution, that it can be solved, that it can be reduced, and to celebrate the night, to raise people's awareness about the values of the night to all of us. So during this week, they try to coordinate and uh, spread awareness of events, uh, lectures, star parties, uh, everything that people uh, around the world can do in their local communities to try to engage uh, our communities and our culture with the night. Mm -hmm. And raise awareness that light pollution is a problem. So many people, particularly people who live in urban areas, may not even be aware of it, or if they're aware of it, they think it's uh, not something that they could, are concerned about or can do anything about. And the idea with International Dark Sky Week, as all of our, uh, all of our efforts throughout the year is to make people aware that that doesn't need to be the way we approach the world. We can really make a difference. I think Flagstaff really particularly has made a huge 
contribution to this effort. Not only did we create the International Dark Sky Places program, by the way, back in 2001, we were the first International Dark Sky City and the first International Dark Sky Place in the Dark Sky program. We actually proposed the program to the International Dark Sky Association. Mm. But by, by do, do, Flagstaff has actually shown that we can do much better than just hold our own with light pollution. We can dramatically reduce it if we just get the community will to do it. The technical solutions are actually quite simple. Shield mm. lights, don't use too much. Uh, use yellow lights when you can, um, because they have much lower impacts on the environment for a variety of reasons. Those are pretty simple, but to actually have them happen, you really need to have the community awareness and the community will to identify it as something that's important to do. And I think we've done a good job with that here. It is by no means the coalition that has done that. It's been really more than 100 years of effort, beginning with Percival Lowell in the 1890s when the Lowell Observatory was established. And Percival Lowell was a businessman, so he right from the very beginning had a good relationship, a, a really intimate relationship, essentially, with the rest of the community. I think the rest of the community really identified with the astronomer who was a, bus a businessman as well, rather than one of those ivory tower folks who doesn't interact with the rest of us very much. So that's really been a good foundation that the Flagstaff has really benefited from over the years. Yeah, and you know, we even talk about uh, one of Percival's um, common uh, um, um, intentions was to make um, you know, uh, the public co-discoverers of the research. So he wrote about the need to you know, talk in, in language that the public can understand instead of you know, drowning your research in um, you know, technical terminology that's not accessible and just, you know, bringing them along with you. And, you know, right from the beginning, he was inviting Flagstaff residents up to Mars Hill to look through um, the temporary telescopes he brought with them before the Clark uh, was built. And so, yeah, and, you know, I mean, gosh, you know, myself, I'm a cultural astronomer and, you know, one of the things I love about the night sky is that, you know, at the same latitude, it's exactly the same data everyone around the world sees. It's the same dots. And how you connect those dots is just, you know, the result of culture um, and all the many variations um, coming through that. And so, you know, it's really, you know, that idea of co-discovery is just, you know, perfect for the night sky because you can literally be out under the sky with thousands of people watching a meteor shower or a comet or something like that and share in that discovery together. Yeah, our coalition members, Lance Diskin and William Seven, make very much a similar point to say not only does the night sky represent or it is an ecosystem that we all experience around the globe equally and the same. We interpret it differently, but we all see the same fundamental resource. But also through time, that sky that you look at tonight is, a, is the same sky that Percival Lowell looked at in 1894. Mm -hmm. It's the same sky that Galileo looked at in 1610. It's the same sky that the Anasazi look at. It's, it's, a, it's a huge uniting, mm -hmm. integrating, uh, connecting, connecting resource that is a such huge, it just touches on the huge value we, we started out our conversation with that uh, we so tragically lose when we build ourselves into a halo of light and we can't see it anymore. The light you see in the sky over your head if you live in an urban area is not the same as the sky you see in Flagstaff or the sky that somebody leaving, even living in that urban area 200 years ago would have seen. It really breaks all of those connections. It's very tragic and that's why we try to raise awareness that this is a huge value, not just for astronomers. Thank you very much. Astronomers very much need dark skies, mm -hmm. but all of us need it. It's something which our spirit is diminished if we lose it. All of our spirits are diminished. You don't have to be an astronomer to go outside at night and look up at the stars. You don't need to know the difference 
to appreciate it. You don't need to know the distances or the temperatures or all the kind of technical esoteric stuff that the astronomers might tell you about, even as interesting as those might be. You don't need to see that to know that that is a huge, that is a huge universe. It really places you in the universe and really helps all of us to feel connected in my view. Oftentimes you hear people say, oh, I feel small and insignificant. No, I think you feel small and connected and it gives you a realistic and accurate perspective on your connection and your relationship to the universe. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great segue to um, um, start uh, exploring, uh, you know, what are the impacts of um, bright skies um, on both humans and animals? Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk um, in recent years about um, our loss of the diurnal cycles um, due to some of this light pollution. Right. Um, yeah, we did allude earlier on that uh, the dark skies can actually mean a lot of things. You can, it can mean the literal thing of how dark is the sky but it can also refer to these other aspects. I think uh, I've heard it said that there are five dimensions to the overall big dark sky topic. One of them is the brightness of the sky, the literal interpretation of dark skies. The other is, uh, it comes to the mind of many people, the idea of safety and security as it's influenced by our artificial lighting. Mm -hmm. Another is ecological impacts of the lighting. How does it affect the diurnal activities of critters when like I think 80% of mammal species are primarily active at night and the presence of light, which is different than the lunar cycle waxing and waning through the month uh, is, is added by human activities. Also human health is affected. We're just an example of a, of a biological system, but the impingement of light into our uh, nights uh, definitely tends to be dominated by the lighting we put on inside, watching television, turning on lights, but also light that leaks into our houses and uh, into our landscapes. And uh, the last one I believe is cult cultural. Our general connection, the fifth dimension of, of dark skies is the cultural connections we talked about a moment ago. Uh, just for uh, just for fun, I wanted to share if it works uh, in our in our connection. Our connection is stable. Uh, an example showing two two identical pieces of sky taken from two areas uh, on a web page here at the FlagstaffDarkSkies.org website. We have a page called Dark Matters. We try to convince people that it matters. <laughs> or off the other hand, we get. So on the left side, you might see uh, a photograph of the summer, a piece of the summer Milky Way. Uh, it's hard to recognize what part of the sky that is, uh, but the, for those who are familiar with the sky, if I roll over the picture, you can see the summer triangle that's connected here with these red lines connecting the star uh, Deneb, Vega, and Altair, easily visible uh, on the dark sky. Those are the brightest stars. They're pretty prominent to uh, the eye in the night sky. Believe it or not, the picture on the right is the same part of the sky, but taken from Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, you can hardly see stars in it. In fact, standing under the sky in Scottsdale, you can hardly see the stars as well. Uh, I can roll over it and you can see the triangle, which maybe at the points of the triangle, you might be able to just see that there are stars there. Mm -hmm. That's about all the stars you can see there, though. Uh, in the Phoenix metropolitan area, I think people might say, if you look, spend a lot of time looking, you might see a few dozen stars. Um, whereas in Flagstaff, you could see a few dozen stars through a pinhole at the end of your, uh, or the, the bottom of your coffee cup <laughs> reflected, in, reflected in your coffee. There's so many stars. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's many times uh, I've, heard visitors at the observatory remark um, <laughs> how many stars they can see. And indeed, um, many people get their first ever views of the Milky Way uh, when they come up to Flagstaff from Phoenix. Right. Uh, one, of the, one of the things we often talk about and trying, trying, it's kind of, this light pollution creates a, a dilemma. 
it creates a kind of a, a cycle which is very hard to break. When you live in an urban area like that, you don't see stars very much. They are not a part of your daily or nightly experience. It's hard to care about stuff that you don't see or that you're not aware of. So if it's hard to care about it, you don't protect it. So it tends to get worse, so you become less aware of it. How do we break that cycle in an urban area like that? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we often point out that there are huge benefits to be had from light pollution reduction, even in urban areas, even though you need, it's hard to get the motivation created to start with uh, in an area where people are so isolated from the night. But once you do that, we often say that even though if, if you, if, if, let's say you imagine that Phoenix metropolitan area could take all of their light out and replace it with light that matched Flagstaff standards, better shielding, in some cases, probably uh, significantly less light for overlighted areas. And not every place is overlighted, but plenty of them are. So less light as well. Shielding is a really important one. Less light, and even a very important one, is the spectrum of light to shift toward the amber portion of the spectrum, the yellow portion of the spectrum. For the majority of light where the yellow uh, color of the light is not an issue, like for parking lots and roadways. You mm -hmm. wouldn't want a yellow, you wouldn't want a yellow light at an outdoor restaurant, for example. You'd probably want a, a whiter light for that. But if you could shift the lighting to Phoenix that way, and light like, Fe like Flagstaff does, you could probably cut the light pollution in Phoenix to one-tenth of wow. what it is. I know that's a dramatic statement and not many would go so far. But if you could cut it to one-tenth, and I will show a picture here in a few minutes that shows <laughs> that I think that's a realistic number. If you cut it to one-tenth, you might go from, oh, a few dozen stars in the sky overhead. You might go, I'm just going to wave my hands. I don't know what the number might really be. It might be 100 or it might be 150 stars still not a stunning dark sky mm -hmm. but you know what you do make a difference on a huge difference on the spread of the light pollution from phoenix mm -hmm. will come down to one tenth as far as it used to go the sky overhead is one tenth as bright as it used to be and that brings out more stars but not a lot lot more but now instead of the light pollution spreading out to 150 miles, it might now go only 20 miles. Mm -hmm. And the areas in the surrounding deserts and the smaller communities surrounding Phoenix would have their skies unblanketed and the stars would return to mm -hmm. Wickenburg and to, uh, I'm not a good on the Phoenix metropolitan uh, uh, satellite cities, but uh, Casa Grande, et cetera, all of these towns, Goodyear, uh, People, people who live down there, maybe some of them are visiting with us now, could share with us. But all of these, many of these communities would have a huge, huge improvement in their skies. They would go from right now, maybe a few hundred stars. Maybe they would reach a thousand. Maybe they would reach 1500. That would make a big difference. So that's, that's something that we often try to use to motivate even urban areas to seriously consider improvements to the light pollution. But not only that, of course, they would save energy. And I left out in my five, the five characteristics, I lost count probably, what are the huge benefits of re, uh, improving light usage and reducing uh, light pollution and protecting dark skies is a reduction in energy. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, a really good point about um, uh, how much you know, the light pollution affects communities around a major city, not just that major city itself. Right. And, um, you know, how many people outside of the city limits would benefit from um, light pollution mitigation within the city. And, and I think that's, that's a really important to, point to make too, um, is that, uh, you know, the uh, International Dark Sky Association, of course, has this, you know, growing um, list of dark sky places. And to get on the list, you don't actually have to have a velvet black sky overhead. You have to do your part um, as a city or, you know, national park, whatever the, the unit may be, to mitigate your 
contribution to light pollution. And so, you know, you even have, you know, uh, cities like Fountain Hills on the eastern edge of Phoenix, that is a international dark sky city um, because it's doing all it can um, to mitigate that pollution. So that's, it's a really important point. Yes, the Dark Sky Places program initially was just the Dark Sky City program. And at that point, yes, like you say, it was, it was, fo it was focused at the bright points on the map, you know, on cities, and, and therefore was really devised to show not necessarily dark skies. We didn't want to exclude big cities and allow small cities. We just wanted to show exactly like what you said, that they're doing what they can and they've made, they've shown a good commitment to dark sky protection and they've had success. They've shown that they've successfully applied their, their commitment. But as the program has expanded, it has now included other areas which are tend to be, some of them are the velvet dark places like dark sky reserves and dark sky mm -hmm. sanctuaries. But um, the dark sky communities are, in my opinion, even more important because mm -hmm. their impacts are much more, uh, much greater and the prospects for improvement are so much greater. Yeah. We don't, we also don't want to give too much of an emphasis to people that, oh, don't worry about protecting dark skies at home in your backyard because we have a nice dark place all oh, way out here in the map or way out there far away. We want to have those dark places in the in the remote areas and we want to protect them. But we don't want to turn, we, we would like our culture not to turn into or to continue to allow uh, that connect, disconnection which happens by allowing mm -hmm. light pollution to be unregulated and rampant in our homes, yeah. in our outer homes, in our communities. We want people not to think about uh, dark skies like a like a, a child visiting a zoo might think of oh i can't see a tiger in the world live but I, in the live world but i can see one at the zoo or i can't see a dark sky at home but i can drive out to chaco canyon and see it for example and by the way we have uh we have uh, dark sky parks here as well in the flagstaff area mm -hmm. i know not all, not all of our viewers uh, are in the flagstaff area but we have uh, three national monuments in flagstaff Sunset Crater, uh, Walnut Canyon, and Wopatki National Monuments, which are dark sky places also in the, in the program. Mm -hmm. Also, by the way, uh, Northern Arizona actually, I think is a, is a hotbed of, let's say <laughs> for dark sky places. Yep. We, have, we have Sedona is a dark sky city. Mm -hmm. Village of Oak Creek is a dark sky city. Camp Verde is a dark sky city. Um, Grand Canyon I, National Park. Grand Canyon National Park is another dark sky park. Yep. I think I think we may have uh, I may have left someone out and I apologize if I've left anybody's uh, name out. Uh, I think Cottonwood is considering applying, but I'm not sure they've received it yet. Uh, but anyway, uh, we have a real cluster of dark sky places and particularly in my view of the highest quality ones because they're focusing on the bright spots in the map and trying to reduce their impacts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wanted to uh, get, show uh, share another picture uh, with mm -hmm. the viewers that talk, that might give some idea that that kind of maybe over dramatic what sounds over dramatic claim about one tenth uh, might be something that I could justify. I think Flagstaff probably is the only place. Uh, maybe I'm being a little bit over the top here, but the best place that I know of that has done the job of documenting how well we've done, of measuring how well we've done in uh, protecting skies by measuring the brightness of the sky, for example. This, uh, this image, uh, or pair of images, which is on the screen now, mm -hmm. shows all sky maps. Uh, they're called hammer Eitoff projections, so they're like half of an oval each. Mm -hmm. but they show the whole horizon from left to right. Uh, the left is the north. Uh, well, actually, they're centered on cities, uh, so that might be they go a complete circle from left to right, and then from the horizon uh, to the zenith at the top of the oval. So that maps the whole sky. On the top image, you can see these are false colors to help uh, convey the brightnesses more effectively, especially on a screen which cannot really show the brightness range that really happens in the sky that your eye could see. So the colors help us see the range and brightness. 
from the yellows and whites and reds are the brightest. Actually, they're all around. White is the brightest, then red, then yellow are getting fainter, then green, then kind of a turquoise color, and then blue and a purple are the darkest. On the top map, you can see a motley uh, band going across the sky, arching across the sky. That's the Milky Way. Much of the map is purple. That's the very darkest of skies. That image is taken by near Ashurst Lake, looking back toward Flagstaff and that little glow of yellow on the horizon in the middle of the map is Flagstaff, the glow over Flagstaff caused by our artificial lighting. That picture is taken about 25 miles from the city. Flagstaff is about 70,000 population. By the way, on the left side uh, is another little glow in the trees there at the bottom of the Milky Way, and that's the Phoenix metropolitan area. Yeah. Uh, the reason we say that we think you can reduce light pollution by a factor of 10 is because the picture on the bottom is another measurement made from 25 miles from another town, this one a little smaller than Flagstaff, it's 60,000. And it's right in the middle of the map there. And you see the sky glow over that city is dramatically greater than Flagstaff. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna give any grief to the poor people in that town, that's Cheyenne, Wyoming. They don't have the history of light pollution awareness and protection uh, as far as I know that Flagstaff has. Mm -hmm. They didn't benefit from Percival Lowell uh, locating an observatory there and keeping the community connected to the night for the last 130 years. But that shows that we think that if you take dark sky seriously and work at it hard, you can make a difference of a factor of 10. The brightness measurements there are actually 13 times brighter. So Cheyenne is 13 wow. times brighter, even though it's only 60,000 versus Flagstaff 70,000. So we really think factor of 10 is, is, is accessible and that is dramatic. It is. I mean, you can you can see clearly, you know, in the top image, uh, the Milky Way is that bridge of brightness, you know, um, uh, stretching across um, or arcing across um, the the graphic there, yep. and it stands out so clearly. Um, and in the bottom image, you can see the Milky Way. It's there, but it's it's much less apparent, um, uh, less dramatic, um, I suppose. Right. And um, yeah, and you know, as you said, Phoenix, right? Um, nearly as big a light dome as Flagstaff um, at that location. So, uh, you know, again, you know, the brightness of light uh, changes dramatically with distance, right? So. Sure. I would say, if you, if, you, if you don't mind me being so bold, I think Phoenix might be a little brighter than Flagstaff. It's true, though, as you head flat out southeast from Flagstaff toward the uh, Lowell Discovery Telescope, mm -hmm. you are you know, getting away from Flagstaff's light pollution, but you're getting closer to Phoenix. I think uh, Happy Jack is kind of the sweet spot. That's about as far as you can go before you start to lose again from the, uh, the, the light produced by the Phoenix metro area. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't need to be that way. Uh, people would say Phoenix is huge. What else can you do? Well, I think you could cut it by a factor of 10. I think they could do uh -huh. that. Yeah. And it, it is. It's, it's very reassuring that, hey, this is actually possible. You know, we've done it here in Flagstaff and your community can do it too. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a, a question that's come in about... Um, uh, um, our dark sky conversation here. Uh, Jeff is asking if anyone has approached, you know, Home Depot or Home Co. Um, uh, about um, marketing or labeling dark sky light fixtures and bulbs, like um, ones that are approved for dark sky use. Yes, we have talked about that idea for quite a long while. Uh, the easier part of that, uh, what easier way to answer that is to say at first that uh, local retailers, family owned retailers, they can do what they want and they have helped out. We have some local retail, uh, of a local principal lighting retailer in Flagstaff who does have a dark sky display, has worked with us 
to help identify dark sky friendly residential lighting. The national franchises are a little more complicated to work with. Um, they are generally, uh, at least our experience is they are limited in what they can do to their displays uh, uh, in terms of information. And also the marketing or the shelving decisions uh, for what goes on their shelves uh, are not made locally. So they're oftentimes not uh, really sensitive to or as sensitive to locally idiosyncratic concerns what unfortunately are locally in the idiosyncratic concerns about dark sky protection i think pretty much everybody who lives in a residential area whether or not they care about the visibility of stars is probably aware of neighbors with un poorly controlled lights lights that shine onto their property. Uh, yeah, I yeah. think that's probably the largest source of light pollution complaint in any community, in Flagstaff included, is not that, oh my, that makes the stars hard to see. It's that they're shining a light into my bedroom window and I don't see why they have to do that. And they don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. So even in big cities, I think that these large retailers would be, should be responsive to these kinds of concerns. But if you go look at the displays in these Home Depot, Lowe's, these national franchises, they are dominated by what we've often said, by what looks good in the daytime and in the store. Mm -hmm. we, of, we oftentimes used to say brass and glass because it shines, it's sparkly, it looks so pretty. It looks like a carriage light, like something that would have been on the front of a horse-drawn carriage, many of them do, mm -hmm. uh, 100 years ago. But it provides horrible lighting at night. It shines it into your eyes across the street. And for every little bit of light that shines into your eyes, uh, the, the amount of light that goes onto your porch or your patio is kind of uh, compromised. We often mm -hmm. say that the unshielded light is like a negative light. It subtracts from the effectiveness of the light that you're trying to put onto the ground. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a long, long diatribe to respond to uh, Jeff's question. But uh, we... I think, I think what will happen really is we will continue to try to work with uh, retailers locally. Uh, we hope other dark sky organizations around the country also, and I, I'm sure they are trying to work with these uh, national franchises. But one of the ways that we can make a difference is you, Jeff, you could go into that store and say, hey, I want a light that doesn't shine on my neighbors. I want a dark sky friendly light. And the more they hear that, I'll tell you, that's the way they respond. Mm -hmm. I don't want to criticize uh, marketers or uh, retailers for responding to the market. That's what they do. That's how their syst our system works. They don't, they don't, uh, their, their job is to sell products and they will sell what people want. So let them know what you want. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're getting close to uh, uh, wrapping up here, but um, uh, I know you've uh, briefly mentioned um, the three uh, kind of elements of choosing a good lighting for outside. Um, but perhaps uh, we could just hit that on the head. You know, what, what temperature should we be looking at? Or, you know, as we look, go into LED lighting, I know it's really not about temperature. It's about, you know, making a, you know, narrow band amber or, you know, something similar to that. Well, for people who get to make their own decisions at home, which I think is most of our viewers, we would always recommend that you, number one, get lights that are shielded. That they put the light onto the ground where you need it, and they don't shine it into people's eyes or across the street. It doesn't do you any good, and it certainly doesn't do your neighbor any good. Mm -hmm. It wastes the energy that you produce. I mean, the electric company doesn't come to you and say at the end of the month, uh, we noticed that of the light you made that you wasted 30% of it, so we're not going to charge you for that part. They, they charge you for all of it. So you're wasting energy, you're wasting money, you're annoying your neighbors, you're not getting as good light, and you're decreasing the visibility. Uh, so shield your lights, get them onto the ground. Replace, uh, try not to think of it as, oh, I don't turn the light on, so it's not a problem. Uh, you know, that's true. When you don't have a light on, there's no light pollution. We often say that when you turn a light off, light pollution goes away at the speed of light. But on the other hand, it comes back as soon as you turn it on again, even if you turn it on only for a few minutes. So shield your lights. 
uh, a light fixture uh, that's shielded is not going to break your budget. We have a page here on our uh, Dark Skies Coalition, flagstaffdarkskies.org, which talks about residential lighting. We have a lot of products listed, um, uh, fixtures here. Uh, including fixtures uh, that are at um, uh, at the uh, national franchises. There are some available. Of all the sea of products they have on their display, usually a few of them are good quality that are shielded, <laughs> like these examples here. Those are the local retailer in Flagstaff called the Light Company, but even Home Depot, you see, we have lots of shielded light options available. Mm -hmm. So, shield your light. Uh, in general, what we used to call bug lights is very highly recommended. Not only does it decrease ecological disturbance, that's why they call them bug lights, is because they generally don't bother the bugs. But bugs, whether you care much about bugs, they're really just a, they're just a canary in the coal mine, in a sense, for the impacts you're having with your lighting on the natural environment. So if you use amber lights, you can decrease that impact on all kinds of things. It also, by the way, dramatically increases or decreases your impact on sky glow. Mm -hmm. So we oftentimes say don't go for CCT or color temperature because once you talk about color temperature of lights, you're really talking about white lights of various kinds, maybe warm white or cool white. Try to get away from that, go to amber lights. They do have, you can find CCTs for those, but just ask for amber lights or bug lights. Those are available um, uh, in retailers and they will make a big difference. Uh, turn them off when you're not using them, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's guidance I'd kind of offer, and people can go to these this web pages and uh, and uh, get some information. Hopefully, that will help them make an improvement at their in their neighborhoods. Where, uh, as we say, to bring back stars where you live. Great. Um, and then uh, uh, there's a question here from uh, JB Dewitt. Um, has uh, your org organization templatized its programming so that others in areas without a dark sky coalition might be able to quickly set one up and be effective? Oh, that's, that's, that's a really good question. Um, we, ha we have not, although we, are, we generally try to be responsive to contact from other mm -hmm. communities. Uh, to try to give them guidance. So we don't have the resources to actually do the legwork for them. You definitely need, e even if we did, that wouldn't be effective. Uh, to be effective, dark sky efforts within the community need to have a strong community local base or it won't work. You're not gonna get it imposed from the outside. But we can help with guidance about what is effective. Uh, and our view has always been to try to get out there and raise people's awareness that night is there. It's half of every 24 hour cycle that it matters. It matters to everybody. It's important to you, either though you're not an astronomer and you may not even know an astronomer. Mm -hmm. uh, and once you do things like that, then you can start getting to the point where you say, hey, by the way, now that you're aware of the night, we can actually make it better if we do this, that, and the other. But really getting that awareness and that value uh, increase is really the most important foundational work that any, every community should, should do. And, and it can be fun. Having star parties, getting people out. Uh, boy, is it fun to show people stars who haven't really uh, looked at them much before. So it's really a lot of fun. Great. Um, uh, okay, there's uh, another question here. Um, do you prefer a moonless sky or a moon sky? Um, I guess uh, uh, we could ask, um, you know, of course, when the moon is up, uh, the sky is bright. Um, how is that different from light pollution that our cities throw into the sky? I, I like that. Uh, I actually, I like the lunar cycle, the changing during the month. I like to leave my uh, windows, window shades open. Mm -hmm. And I like to be able, as I wake up in the night or uh, go to bed at night, I like to be able to see that sometimes of the month it's brighter and other times it's fainter. That natural mm -hmm. cycle is very affirming to me. Mm -hmm. But you're right. When the moon is up, uh, the sky can be bright, if it's, if, particularly if it's toward full moon. Uh, how is that different than light pollution? Well, the moon, we've just talked about it. The moon waxes and wanes with the month. 
Uh, light pollution from a city does not wax and wane from the month. It's there all the time. You never get a chance to have a new a new moon when you have uh, when you have uh, significant amounts of light pollution. So what it does is light pollution flattens out and removes that natural cycle. Uh, also, usually the moon is not up all night most of the time, except during full moon. So you'll have a portion of the night when the sky is still dark. So those are some of the differences. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, uh, thank you so much, Chris, for joining us uh, here this morning on Cosmic Coffee. And um, uh, would you just uh, share with us the website for the Flagstaff Dark Skies Coalition? I would like to thank you so much, Danielle, and thank you for inviting me onto the program. I sure hope that some people listen, uh, listening uh, uh, realize that dark skies is something important to them as well. Uh, I'm going to go back just to our homepage and point out uh, the flag, it's flagstaffdarkskies.org. Okay. Um, I would also point out, uh, if you don't mind, a very, very, very small pitch that uh -huh. we have a we would welcome uh, people to join. Uh, and to support our efforts. Our efforts are bigger than Flagstaff. We are serving, we believe, as an example of real practical results nationwide and worldwide. There's nobody who has done it as well as Flagstaff who makes the point that we can make a big difference if we do it the way Flagstaff does it. And we've proven that it can, not only that it work, that it can be done, but that it works. Right. So on the left side of every one of our pages is a join and a donate button. You don't need to be a Flagstaff president. We have we have members from Texas and uh, South Carolina, mm -hmm. so uh, we welcome anybody at all. We have a message that's bigger than just Flagstaff, and we hope you can help us spread it, Great. as you have helped us do that. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, it's it's our pleasure. Uh, we're all in this together, um, and uh, we all benefit um, from those gorgeous dark skies. So uh, thank you, Chris. Um, and to our viewers, thank you so much for joining us for another cup of Cosmic Coffee. We'll see you next Thursday morning. Thanks so much. Okay, good night, everyone.